Recording by Louise J. Bell. Part One of Wake Not the Dead. Wilt thou forever sleep? Wilt thou never more awake, my beloved, but henceforth repose forever from thy short pilgrimage on earth? O oh, yet once again return and bring back with thee the vivifying dawn of hope to one whose existence hath, since thy departure, been obscured by the dunnest shades. What? Dumb? Forever dumb? Thy friend lamenteth, and thou heedest him not. He sheds bitter, scalding tears, and thou reposest unregarding his affliction. He is in despair, and thou no longer openest thy arms to him as an asylum from his grief? Say then, doth the paley shroud become thee better than the bridal veil? Is the chamber of the grave a warmer bed than the couch of love? Is the spectered death more welcome to thy arms than thy enamored consort? O oh, return, my beloved, return once again to this anxious, disconsolate bosom. Such were the lamentations which Walter poured forth for his Brunhilde, the partner of his youthful, passionate love. Thus did he bewail over her grave at the midnight hour, what time the spirit that presides in the troublous atmosphere sends his legions of monsters through mid-air, so that their shadows, as they flit beneath the moon and across the earth, dart as wild, agitating thoughts that chase each other o'er the sinner's bosom. Thus did he lament under the tall linden trees by her grave, while his head reclined on the cold stone. Walter was a powerful lord in Burgundy, who in his earliest youth had been smitten with the charms of the fair Brunhilde, a beauty far surpassing in loveliness all her rivals. For her tresses, dark as the raven face of night, streaming over her shoulders, set off to the utmost advantage the beaming luster of her slender form, and the rich dye of a cheek whose tint was deep and brilliant as that of the western heaven. Her eyes did not resemble those burning orbs whose pale glow gems the vault of night, and whose immeasurable distance fills the soul with deep thoughts of eternity, but rather as the sober beams which cheer this nether world, and which, while they enlighten, kindle the sons of earth to joy and love. Brunhilde became the wife of Walter, and both, being equally enamored and devoted, they abandoned themselves to the enjoyment of a passion that rendered them reckless of aught besides, while it lulled them in a fascinating dream. Their sole apprehension was lest aught should awaken them from a delirium which they prayed might continue forever. Yet, how vain is the wish that would arrest the decrees of destiny! As well might it seek to divert the circling planets from their eternal course. Short was the duration of this frenzied passion. Not that it gradually decayed and subsided into apathy, but death snatched away his blooming victim and left Walter to a widowed couch. Impetuous, however, as was his first burst of grief, he was not inconsolable, for ere long another bride became the partner of the youthful nobleman. Svanhilda also was beautiful, although nature had formed her charms on a very different model from those of Brunhilde. Her golden locks waved bright as the beams of morn. Only when excited by some emotion of her soul did a rosy hue tinge the lily paleness of her cheek. Her limbs were proportioned in the nicest symmetry, 
yet did they not possess that luxuriant fullness of animal life her eye beamed eloquently but it was with the milder radiance of a star tranquilizing to tenderness rather than exciting to warmth thus formed it was not possible that she should steep him in his former delirium although she rendered happy his waking hours tranquil and serious yet cheerful studying in all things her husband's pleasure she restored order and comfort in his family where her presence shed a general influence all around her mild benevolence tended to restrain the fiery impetuous disposition of walter while at the same time her prudence recalled him in some degree from his vain turbulent wishes and his aspirings after unattainable enjoyments to the duties and pleasures of actual life Svanhilda bore her husband two children a son and a daughter the latter was mild and patient as her mother well contented with her solitary sports and even in these recreations displayed the serious turn of her character the boy possessed his father's fiery restless disposition tempered however with the solidity of his mother attached by his offspring more tenderly towards their mother walter now lived for several years very happily his thoughts would frequently indeed recur to brunhilde but without their former violence merely as we dwell upon the memory of a friend of our earlier days born from us on the rapid current of time to a region where we know that he is happy but clouds dissolve into air flowers fade the sands of the hourglass run imperceptibly away and even so do human feelings dissolve fade and pass away and with them too human happiness walter's inconstant breast again sighed for the ecstatic dreams of those days which he had spent with his equally romantic enamoured brunhilde again did she present herself to his ardent fancy in all the glow of her bridal charms and he began to draw a parallel between the past and the present nor did imagination as it is wont fail to array the former in her brightest hues while it proportionably obscured the latter so that he pictured to himself the one much more rich in enjoyment and the other much less so than they really were this change in her husband did not escape svanhilde whereupon redoubling her attentions towards him and her cares towards their children she expected by this means to reunite the knot that was slackened yet the more she endeavoured to regain his affections the colder did he grow the more intolerable did her caresses seem and the more continually did the image of brunhilde haunt his thoughts the children whose endearments were now become indispensable to him alone stood between the parents as genie eager to effect a reconciliation and beloved by them both formed a uniting link between them yet as evil can be plucked from the heart of man only ere its root has yet struck deep its fangs being afterwards too firm to be eradicated so was walter's diseased fancy too far affected to have its disorder stopped for in a short time it completely tyrannized over him frequently of a night instead of retiring to his consort's chamber he repaired to brunhilde's grave where he murmured forth his discontent saying wilt thou sleep for ever 
one night as he was reclining on the turf indulging in his wonted sorrow a sorcerer from the neighboring mountains entered into this field of death for the purpose of gathering for his mystic spells such herbs as grow only from the earth wherein the dead repose and which as if the last production of mortality are gifted with a powerful and supernatural influence the sorcerer perceived the mourner and approached the spot where he was lying wherefore fond wretch dost thou grieve thus for what is now a hideous mass of mortality mere bones and nerves and veins nations have fallen unlamented even worlds themselves long ere this globe of ours was created have mouldered into nothing nor hath any one wept over them why then shouldst thou indulge this vain affliction for a child of the dust a being as frail as thyself and like thee the creature but of a moment Walter raised himself up let yon worlds that shine in the firmament replied he lament for each other as they perish it is true that i who am myself clay lament for my fellow clay yet is this clay impregnated with a fire with an essence that none of the elements of creation possess with love and this divine passion i felt for her who now sleepeth beneath this sod will thy complaints awaken her or could they do so would she not soon upbraid thee for having disturbed that repose in which she has now hushed avaunt cold-hearted being thou knowest not what is love oh that my tears could wash away the earthy covering that conceals her from these eyes that my groan of anguish could rouse her from her slumber of death no she would not again seek her earthy couch insensate that thou art and couldst thou endure to gaze without shuddering on one disgorged from the jaws of the grave art thou too thyself the same from whom she parted or hath time passed o'er thy brow and left no traces there would not thy love rather be converted into hate and disgust say rather that the stars would leave yon firmament that the sun will henceforth refuse to shed his beams through the heavens oh that she stood once more before me that once again she reposed on this bosom how quickly should we then forget that death or time had ever stepped between us delusion mere delusion of the brain from heated blood like to that which arises from the fumes of wine it is not my wish to tempt thee to restore to thee thy dead else wouldst thou soon feel that i have spoken truth how restore her to me exclaimed walter casting himself at the sorcerer's feet oh if thou art indeed able to effect that grant it to my earnest supplication if one throb of human feeling vibrates in thy bosom let my tears prevail with thee restore to me my beloved so shalt thou hereafter bless the deed and see that it was a good work a good work a blessed deed returned the sorcerer with a smile of scorn for me there exists nor good nor evil since my will is always the same ye alone know evil who will that which ye would not 
it is indeed in my power to restore her to thee. Yet bethink thee well, whether it will prove thy weal. Consider, too, how deep the abyss between life and death. Across this my power can build a bridge, but it can never fill up the frightful chasm. Walter would have spoken, and have sought to prevail on this powerful being by fresh entreaties, but the latter prevented him, saying, Peace, bethink thee well, and return hither to me to-morrow at midnight. Yet once more do I warn thee, wake not the dead. Having uttered these words, the mysterious being disappeared. Intoxicated with fresh hope, Walter found no sleep on his couch, for fancy, prodigal of her richest stores, expanded before him the glittering web of futurity, and his eye, moistened with the dew of rapture, glanced from one vision of happiness to another. During the next day he wandered through the woods, lest wanted objects, by recalling the memory of later and less happier times, might disturb the blissful idea that he should again behold her, again fold her in his arms, gaze on her beaming brow by day, repose on her bosom at night. And as this sole idea filled his imagination, how was it possible that the least doubt should arise, or that the warning of the mysterious old man should recur to his thoughts? No sooner did the midnight hour approach than he hastened before the grave field where the sorcerer was already standing by that of Brunhilde. Hast thou maturely considered? inquired he. Oh, restore to me the object of my ardent passion, exclaimed Walter with impetuous eagerness. Delay not thy generous action, lest I die even this night, consumed with disappointed desire, and behold her face no more. Well, then answered the old man. Return hither again to-morrow at the same hour. But once more do I give thee this friendly warning. Wake not the dead. All in the despair of impatience, Walter would have prostrated himself at his feet and supplicated him to fulfill at once a desire now increased to agony but the sorcerer had already disappeared. Pouring forth his lamentations more wildly and impetuously than ever, he lay upon the grave of his adored one until the gray dawn streaked the east. During the day, which seemed to him longer than any he had ever experienced, he wandered to and fro, restless and impatient, seemingly without any object, and deeply buried in his own reflections, in quest as the murderer who meditates his first deed of blood. And the stars of evening found him once more at the appointed spot. At midnight the sorcerer was there also. Hast thou yet maturely deliberated? inquired he, as on the preceding night. Oh, what should I deliberate? returned Walter impatiently. I need not to deliberate. What I demand of thee is that which thou hast promised me, that which will prove my bliss. Or dost thou but mock me? If so, hence from my sight, lest I be tempted to lay my hand on thee. Once more do I warn thee, 
answered the old man with undisturbed composure. Wake not the dead. Let her rest. Ay, but not in the cold grave. She shall, rather, rest on this bosom, which burns with eagerness to clasp her. Reflect. Thou mayst not quit her until death, even though aversion and horror should seize thy heart. There would then remain only one horrible means. Dotard, cried Walter, interrupting him. How may I hate that which I love with such intensity of passion? How should I abhor that for which my every drop of blood is boiling? Then be it even as thou wishest, answered the sorcerer. Step back. The old man now drew a circle round the grave, all the while muttering words of enchantment. Immediately, the storm began to howl among the tops of the trees. Owls flapped their wings and uttered their low voice of omen. The stars hid their mild, beaming aspect that they might not behold so unholy and impious a spectacle. The stone then rolled from the grave with a hollow sound, leaving a free passage for the inhabitant of that dreadful tenement. The sorcerer scattered into the yawning earth roots and herbs of most magic power and of most penetrating odor, so that the worms, crawling forth from the earth, congregated together and raised themselves in a fiery column over the grave, while rushing wind burst from the earth scattering the mold before it, until, at length, the coffin lay uncovered. The moonbeams fell on it, and the lid burst open with a tremendous sound. Upon this, the sorcerer poured upon it some blood from out of a human skull, exclaiming at the same time, Drink, sleeper of this warm stream, that thy heart may again beat within thy bosom. And, after a short pause, shedding on her some other mystic liquid, he cried aloud with the voice of one inspired, Yes, thy heart beats once more with the flood of life. Thine eye is again opened to sight. Arise, therefore, from the tomb. As an island suddenly springs forth from the dark waves of the ocean, raised upwards from the deep by the force of subterraneous fires, so did Brunhilde start from her earthy couch, borne forward by some invisible power. Taking her by the hand, the sorcerer led her towards Walter, who stood at some little distance, rooted to the ground with amazement. Receive again, said he, the object of thy passionate sighs. Mayest thou never more require my aid. Should that, however, happen, so wilt thou find me, during the full of the moon, upon the mountains, in that spot, and where the three roads meet. Instantly did Walter recognize, in the form that stood before him, her whom he so ardently loved, and a sudden glow shot through his frame at finding her thus restored to him. Yet the night frost had chilled his limbs and palsied his tongue. For a while, he gazed upon her without either motion or speech. 
and during this pause all was again become hushed and serene and the stars shone brightly in the clear heavens walter exclaimed the figure and at once the well-known sound thrilling to his heart broke the spell by which he was bound is it reality is it truth cried he or a cheating delusion no it is no imposture i am really living conduct me quickly to thy castle in the mountains walter looked around the old man had disappeared but he perceived close by his side a coal-black steed of fiery eye ready equipped to conduct him thence and on his back lay all proper attire for brunhilde who lost no time in arraying herself this being done she cried haste let us away ere the dawn breaks for my eye is yet too weak to endure the light of day fully recovered from his stupor walter leapt into his saddle and catching up with a mingled feeling of delight and awe the beloved being thus mysteriously restored from the power of the grave he spurred on across the wild towards the mountains as furiously as if pursued by the shadows of the dead hastening to recover from him their sister the castle to which walter conducted his brunhilde was situated on a rock between other rocks rising up above it here they arrived unseen by any save one aged domestic on whom walter imposed secrecy by the severest threats here will we tarry said brunhilde until i can endure the light and until thou canst look upon me without trembling as if struck with a cold chill they accordingly continued to make that place their abode yet no one knew that brunhilde existed save only that aged attendant who provided their meals during seven entire days they had no light except that of tapers during the next seven the light was admitted through the lofty casements only while the rising or setting sun faintly illumined the mountain tops the valley being still enveloped in shade seldom did walter quit brunhilde's side a nameless spell seemed to attach him to her even the shudder which he felt in her presence and which would not permit him to touch her was not unmixed with pleasure like that thrilling awful emotion felt when strains of sacred music float under the vault of some temple he rather sought therefore than avoided this feeling often too as he had indulged in calling to mind the beauties of brunhilde she had never appeared so fair so fascinating so admirable when depicted by his imagination as when now beheld in reality never till now had her voice sounded with such tones of sweetness never before did her language possess such eloquence as it now did when she conversed with him on the subject of the past and this was the magic fairyland towards which her words constantly conducted him ever did she dwell upon the days of their first love those hours of delight in which they had participated together when the one derived all enjoyment from the other and so rapturous so enchanting so full of life did she recall to his imagination that blissful season that he even doubted whether he had ever experienced with her so much felicity 
or had been so truly happy and while she thus vividly portrayed their hours of past delight she delineated in still more glowing more enchanting colors those hours of approaching bliss which now awaited them richer in enjoyment than any preceding ones in this manner did she charm her attentive auditor with enrapturing hopes for the future and lull him into dreams of more than mortal ecstasy so that while he listened to her siren strain he entirely forgot how little blissful was the latter period of their union when he had often sighed at her imperiousness and at her harshness both to himself and all his household yet even had he recalled this to mind would it have disturbed him in his present delirious trance had she not now left behind in the grave all the frailty of mortality was not her whole being refined and purified by that long sleep in which neither passion nor sin had approached her even in dreams how different now was the subject of her discourse only when speaking of her affection for him did she betray anything of earthly feeling at other times she uniformly dwelt upon themes relating to the invisible and future world when in descanting and declaring the mysteries of eternity a stream of prophetic eloquence would burst from her lips in this manner had twice seven days elapsed and for the first time walter beheld the being now dearer to him than ever in the full light of day every trace of the grave had disappeared from her countenance a roseate tinge like the ruddy streaks of dawn again beamed on her pallid cheek the faint mouldering taint of the grave was changed into a delightful violet scent the only sign of earth that never disappeared he no longer felt either apprehension or awe as he gazed upon her in the sunny light of day it was not until now that he seemed to have recovered her completely and glowing with all his former passion towards her he would have pressed her to his bosom but she gently repulsed him saying not yet spare your caresses until the moon has again filled her horn spite of his impatience walter was obliged to await the lapse of another period of seven days but on the night when the moon was arrived at the full he hastened to brunhilda whom he found more lovely than she had ever appeared before fearing no obstacles to his transports he embraced with all the fervor of a deeply enamored and successful lover brunhilde however still refused to yield to his passion what exclaimed she is it fitting that i who have been purified by death from the frailty of mortality should become thy concubine while a mere daughter of the earth bears the title of thy wife never shall it be no it must be within the walls of thy palace within that chamber where i once reigned as queen that thou obtainest the end of thy wishes and of mine also added she imprinting a glowing kiss on the lips and immediately disappeared heated with passion and determined to sacrifice everything to the accomplishment of his desires 
Walter hastily quitted the apartment, and shortly after, the castle itself. He travelled over mountain and across heath with the rapidity of a storm, so that the turf was flung up by his horse's hooves nor once stopped till he arrived home. Here, however, neither the affectionate caresses of Svanhilda or those of his children could touch his heart, or induce him to restrain his furious desires. Alas, is the impetuous torrent to be checked in its devastating course by the beauteous flowers over which it rushes, when they exclaim, Destroyer, commiserate our helpless innocence and beauty, nor lay us waste. The stream sweeps over them unregarding, and a single moment annihilates the pride of a whole summer. Shortly afterwards did Walter begin to hint to Svanhilda that they were ill-suited to each other, that he was anxious to taste that wild, tumultuous life so well according with the spirit of his sex, while she, on the contrary, was satisfied with the monotonous circle of household enjoyments, that he was eager for whatever promised novelty, while she felt most attached to what was familiarized to her by habit. And lastly, that her cold disposition, bordering upon indifference, but ill-assorted with his ardent temperament. It was, therefore, more prudent that they should seek, apart from each other, that happiness which they could not find together. A sigh and a brief acquiescence in his wishes was all the reply that Svanhilda made. And, on the following morning, upon his presenting her with a paper of separation, informing her that she was at liberty to return home to her father, she received it most submissively. Yet, ere she departed, she gave him the following warning. Too well do I conjecture to whom I am indebted for this our separation. Often have I seen thee at Brunhilde's grave, and beheld thee there even on that night when the face of the heavens was suddenly enveloped in a veil of clouds. Hast thou rashly dared to tear aside the awful veil that separates the mortality that dreams from that which dreameth not? Oh, then woe to thee! Thou wretched man, for thou hast attached to thyself that which will prove thy destruction. She ceased. Nor did Walter attempt any reply, for the similar admonition, uttered by the sorcerer, flashed upon his mind, all obscured as it was by passion, just as the lightning glares momentarily through the gloom of night, without dispersing the obscurity. Svanhilda then departed in order to pronounce to her children a bitter farewell. For they, according to national custom, belonged to the father. And, having bathed them in her tears, and consecrated them with the holy water of maternal love, she quitted her husband's residence and departed to the home of her fathers. End of Part 1 of Wake Not the Dead Recording by Louise J. Bell Sebastopol, California